Solid fuel makes a thorium breeder reactor an economic impossibility. Solid fuel impedes the efficient consumption of uranium as well. Solid fuel leads to larger stockpiles of nuclear waste, which would otherwise be recycled into energy. And solid fuel ensures all breeder reactors ever created by humans will inevitably use the fast spectrum instead of thermal spectrum. Those breeders won't use moderating material to sustain criticality. Yes, that is another rearticulation of the OECD report. Fast spectrum, thermal spectrum, moderator. You've heard Dr. Per Peterson, Kirk Sorensen, and members of India's nuclear program state that thorium is best suited to liquid fuel reactors. We're about to explore the technical reasons behind this, what these terms mean, and why they're important. We will examine the need for ongoing chemistry inside a thorium reactor. And we'll review the science behind all nuclear power, starting at the very basics. But before we do, I'd like to share my personal feelings about nuclear power. I have no qualm with solid fuel reactors. They are statistically one of the safest forms of energy generation. Hundreds are in operation, and they've been producing pollution-free energy for decades. In fact, today's nuclear power is carbon-free energy, right between solar power and wind power in terms of minuscule carbon emission. So I'd very much like to see existing nuclear plants continue to operate until we finally stop burning coal for energy. But that isn't happening. Can you give me an update on Diablo? What update do you need except to close it down? I cannot believe you are shutting down an operating source of reliable, clean energy. In fact, nuclear plants are shutting down faster than new ones are being built. The nuclear industry is a death industry. It's a cancer industry. This is crazy. You are sitting on top of a nuclear weapon. Operating reactors are being shut down and replaced with solar and wind power backed up by natural gas and coal. Most of the ones that are kind of cute and cuddly, it's energy farming. There's the intermittency prop. You have to have some way of getting energy during those time periods that it's not available. During the day, we generate as much electricity as we can using solar. At night, and when it's cloudy, we use more natural gas. Each year, we probably get over 200 days of sunshine, but there's 165 more days without as big as this solar plant is, it's not enough to meet our customers' needs. The plant operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's why we need natural gas. The result being higher, not lower, greenhouse gas emissions. We are headed in the wrong direction. Will a marginally better solid fuel reactor change this? I don't think so, because a marginally better solid fuel reactor is already under construction. It's a pretty darn good reactor, and it might almost become economically competitive with fossil fuel if a strong learning curve is established in their manufacture and assembly. It has great passive safety features designed to survive a Fukushima-like loss of power to its cooling pumps. I'd like to introduce you to the AP-1000. The AP-1000 plant is designed to meet the world's growing need for electricity. So how does Westinghouse explain this pressurized water reactor's passive safety system to the public? As the steam from the in-containment refueling water storage tank fills containment, pressure increases until a certain point is detected by the instrumentation and control system. Then the instrumentation and control system sends a signal to automatically open redundant air-operated valves. Welcome to the exciting world of nuclear industry communications. I, I was kind of surprised looking at the communication of the AP-1000, how it didn't seem like it was trying to, uh, to appeal to a mass audience. They fear if there's any hint that if you say, hey, there's a better reactor here, the new all-wheel drive, all-leather seats reactor has arrived, that casts doubt on the predecessors that are still in operation. 
The valves allow water to flow by gravity from the passive containment cooling water storage tank located on top of the shield building to provide additional cooling of the steel containment vessel. Are they trying to tell us the AP-1000 is a particularly safe reactor? I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Helen Caldicott. An AP-1000, which is still a light water reactor like the ones you have here, but it's cheaper because it's got less steel and less concrete in it, and it's called an eggshell reactor <laughs> in the industry, so it could easily have an accident. It's very dangerous. She's a prominent anti-nuclear activist and funded the author of this thorium-dismissing report. I think you should not put nuclear energy on the table. It sucks the air out of the energy policy discussion. She uses debunked, fabricated visuals to sell books. Well, they'll be dying of cancer, but they're not dying from lack of electricity. They might be sweating a bit in the summer. Oh, but you mustn't be too hot in the summer. That's what we've got sweat glands for. And to scare people into protesting operating reactors. And the industry has never, ever called her out on it. In Seattle, the ambient levels of radiation went up 40,000 times above normal. And I've got a, um, a few slides. This is the fallout from Fukushima. Ambient levels of radiation in Seattle went up 40,000 times. This was released by the Australian Radiation Service, which has actually come to pass. So here's Japan, and here are you. And the ambient levels of radiation in Seattle went up 40,000 times above normal. The ambient levels in, in Seattle went up 40,000 times above normal. Because of this, Dr. Helen Caldicott knows she can say whatever she wants with no regard for the truth. Parts of Tokyo are extremely radioactive. Nuclear power produces massive quantities of global warming gas. There are wild boar in uh, Germany that almost glow in the dark. But 40% of the food probably in Europe is radioactive. More people have died from Chernobyl than in the Black Plague. Do you think that the industry should debunk people that are less credible? I think that when somebody makes false statements about nuclear, uh, that's when you need to address those statements specifically. And in some cases, you need to uh, demonstrate why the person who made the statement has no credibility. A number of people are making false claims and they're not getting challenged. What's with the nuclear industry that they don't do that? They don't care. They don't have to. Big nuclear is going to survive and as a matter of fact, it's going to flourish. The industry has a philosophy of as long as nobody's thinking about us, that's a good thing. Uh, they like to do their job quietly and uh, hope for the best. Look at what Westinghouse is doing in China. They have, to my knowledge, four AP-1000s being built right now, another 12 on order. Maybe China's going a little fast, but also the Chinese government is acutely aware of its pollution. It doesn't like nuclear power. Nuclear energy is a kind of energy. It is safe. People of the city make the life better because all your under the coal is a limited source. We had better not to use the coal. Uh, industry cannot get much energy from the sun. And China is a big country, and so nuclear power is necessary. There were some Eskimos, Inuits, and they had their normal life, and they dried their fish and plaited the, the leather and hunted the polar bears and lived in their igloos. And then they got electricity. And then they got television. And then the young men and women left to go to a better life. And their life was destroyed. That's what I'm talking about. I was in China in 88. There wasn't a single car. There were millions of bicycles. There was one tall building in Beijing. And I said, if China goes the way of America and they all get refrigerators and cars, we've had it. There are people who are really using very, very little material and very, very little energy. They are so green and they are so eager to stop being that kind of green. The main economic and demographic event in the world now is people are getting the hell out of poverty. Wires everywhere because they need electricity to do all the stuff that means being part of a city. 
how can I change this distribution so that most of this energy is being generated by non-carbon emitting sources? And then furthermore, how can I grow the pie itself so that other people in the world can enjoy energy at something a whole lot closer to a Western lifestyle? Because most of the world, especially the developing world, would love to have these things. And frankly, I think we should want them to have these things. People always talk about China's consumption of energy and the emission of the CO2 as the largest quantity of the world. China export. The consumption of the energy in China is not, not, not only for China, but for the, for the world. But in, in US, not only per capita wise, the, the highest energy consumption country, but also take advantage of other country to make import the goods energy consumed in other country rather than in the US. A lot of the energy used here in China is not for consume, it's for production. of energy consumption, it's an unbelievably optimized process. There's not the same room for improvement, which is largely industrial processes. This is a 200 ton electric arc furnace. The main power source for the furnace is electricity. And so each furnace at max power is about 105 megawatts. So you've been able to drop your power consumption per ton almost about a third, it looks like. Probably since the, uh, the mid, early 80s. So besides your scrap material input, what's your next largest cost on production? Electricity. Electricity. In a week's time, if both fires are going, we'll probably use more electricity than the city of Chicago use in a year. Yep. Wow. <laughs> In fact, one of the things that we've been chasing is, you know, we've got all this waste heat, but it's the nature of it that doesn't lend itself very well to, you know, throwing in a conventional Rankin cycle somewhere. In theory, back of the napkin kind of stuff, maybe we could recover another 20 or 30 megawatts out of the 200 we're sharing between these two furnaces. So as we probably captured 90% of what's to be captured, chasing the last 10% is pretty expensive. Most people don't understand everything you look at, touch, feel, anything is tangible. There's energy behind it, a lot of it. Don't eat any Japanese food. No seaweed, no miso, no fish, nothing. I know Japanese food is that. I went to a restaurant in New York the other day, sushi restaurant. People bring me sake and girls all dressed up and their big shoes that they wear these days and everything. <laughs> and I said, where did the fish come from? Oh, they said Japan. So I got fish from New Zealand. I mean, you got the, the same people that demand fresh fish be flown in from Alaska in cold storage. They're the ones that, oh, we got to have wind power. We got to have all these all these options that aren't viable. So yeah, uh, it's a frustration we felt in this industry. So we saw the other day how electrical power was used to make steel from recycled materials. You know, those operations couldn't proceed if they thought in two hours they might or might not have power. They would not be able to make steel that way. They have to have reliable energy sources. Well, Mozart and, and Shakespeare wrote by candlelight. Ooh, candlelight. I'm writing an article for the International Herald Tribune now about the future of nuclear power, and I ended it by saying that and said, and they, the editor wrote back and said, well, you don't want to encourage people to think they have to go to candlelight again. Well, what's wrong with candlelight? That's right. That's right. The World Health Organization has concluded fossil fuel air pollution kills more than three and a half million people per year. That's 10,000 people per day. 10,000 people is more than have been killed by nuclear power in the history of the planet, you know, so we have to we have to be objective in comparing the environmental impacks of uh, different energy sources. Until I heard about thorium, 
and began learning about nuclear power, I had no idea nuclear power was carbon-free. We have to phase out carbon emissions at a rate of several percent a year. I don't see any way we can do that without the help of nuclear power. Nuclear power is essentially carbon-free energy. And until I fact-checked Caldecott's dismissal of thorium, educate your friends and get the word out about thorium, I had no idea how much misinformation had been propagated. As James Hansen says at NASA, the godfather of global warming, we've got to stop burning coal now. Germany's now decided that 80% of its energy is going to come from renewables shortly. The people who argue for all renewables think that, well, if we can go from 0% to 10% to 20% renewable, then we're on the way and then it will get easier and we'll get 100%. Well, it's actually, if you look at the engineering, it's actually the opposite. When you get to 20 or 30%, then it gets harder, not easier, because of the intermittency of the renewables. But current reactors can only generate clean energy at questionable prices. Long periods between projects uh, and long periods between the task, this is what I would call the ideal conditions for forgetting rather than learning. If you're in manufacturing, you're doing the same task every week or month or day, depending on the, 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 time, the time step of the factory. These you don't, you have different people in different places to different standards. This is a conditions for forgetting, not for learning. If AP1000's costs can be controlled enough to compete with coal plants, then coal will get cheaper. Successfully reducing our dependence on fossil fuel will result in a glut of cheap coal, oil, and natural gas. We need more than borderline competitiveness to keep people from burning those cheaper and cheaper sources of dirty energy. Nuclear power plants are capable of much more than producing marginally competitive baseload electricity. So what can they do? Let's return to first principles and then re-examine what it is the human race needs in order to thrive with minimal impact on our environment.